from Princeton University. Um, remember the dynamics. You ask during as much as you want. Give me just three seconds to get there with the microphone. Okay? okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so this indeed is my uh, first lecture. Uh, first, I want to thank the organizers uh, for yeah, organizing school and for inviting me to give a, a series of talks. I just arrived this morning, so I'm kind of jumping in. Um, uh, and um, so my my lectures, I would say, uh, would follow uh, and it on the uh, the lectures that Jan has given so far. Uh, the topic, of course, is the same one uh, as the the topic of the school. Um, which is holography, um, uh, and uh, one one question at least that I think is already good to ask for yourself uh, is, um, yeah, why? Uh, why are we organizing the school? Uh, why are we thinking about it? Uh, why are you here to try to learn uh, about uh, what what's yeah the latest developments in the field? Um, and, and of course. One of the answers uh, to the question or is uh, holography is a, clearly a, a hint that we have about uh, how we want to understand aspects of, of quantum gravity um, and, uh, and of black holes. Generally, indeed, again, as a physicist, uh, we would li like to tell ourselves that we uh, are trying to find uh, how nature works. Um, and then uh, one of the good things, uh, at least, uh, for a physicist to have uh, is principles. Um, uh, and then it turns out that uh, when you have the principles, uh, then at some point you can get yourself still in, in trouble. Uh, uh, and that there's one or the other principle that you have to start sort of uh, start questioning. Uh, and that's actually in some sense the situation that we're in. Uh, and I would say that's actually a, a very exciting um, uh, time to be in. Uh, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit more why that's exciting. Uh, one, my principles, so let me write them, uh, write them down. Um, uh, I'm a believer in, in quantum mechanics. Uh, I believe that quantum mechanics is indeed the, the right way of describing the microphysical world. Uh, I don't necessarily believe that uh, our, our universe is in some kind of pure state. <laughs> Uh, but nonetheless, uh, anything that we want to understand from the fundamental point of view uh, is, is, is described by quantum mechanics. Uh, of course, one of the other uh, things that quantum mechanics can do is describe uh, particle physics in particular, uh, and it's, it's enormously successful, and it's our most um, uh, yeah, precise and successful theory, where in particular we use quantum field theory to describe particle physics. Um, but uh, that does not include gravity. Uh, nonetheless, again, we can compute numbers up to 10 decimal places and then verify experimentally. Uh, so that seems to work. Um, now, uh, in order to introduce gravity, indeed, um, uh, new ingredients come in, and Jan already explained a lot of this, uh, sort of what has been happening more, late, uh, more recently. Uh, we're also living in a time where information, uh, and in, in this particular context, quantum information, uh, has, plays an important role. Uh, people nowadays are trying to build quantum computers uh, as a way of yeah, uh, manipulating quantum information. And it's a resource, and it's also an intellectual kind of, or at least it's an organizational principle that allows us to understand physical systems. So that's extremely, again, also interesting. Uh, one tension between uh, uh, these two topics already, uh, and now I'm, and when I'm talking about sort of yeah, principles, um, if I give you a quantum field theory, uh, typically what people mean by that is something where you've taken something that's called a continuum limit. Uh, uh, and if you take the continuum limit, then basically space time is continuous, and then you have local operators that you can act at arbitrarily uh, small distances from each other. Uh, and then you have, in principle, things that can happen at very short distances that lead to things that we call UV divergences. Um, and one of the problems of quantum field theory is precisely that if you want to compute the amount of entanglement between two re regions of space that are uh, touching each other, uh, that entanglement actually diverges because of this UV divergence. So there's already a tension between the whole notion that you should be able to quantify quantum information 
uh, and the fact that nature is uh, described by quantum field theory. So therefore, basically, at this point, we're already telling ourselves that, that, that quantum field theory is not the end by which we have to describe uh, nature. We have to find something else. Now, yeah, you can say, okay, that's easy. Uh, there are other things that you can describe that are not quantum field theory. Um, and lead, let me, uh, I'm only putting letters here. If you want to know what these letters are, you make notes. Uh, quantum many body physics. So, so you just take a, a quantum mechanical system with many moving parts. Um, it's easy to, to sort of jump here and say, hey, uh, okay, fine, uh, now we have gotten rid of the problem of quantum field theory uh, uh, being, being sort of not so well defined from the point of view of quantum information. However, quantum field theory is very well motivated. Uh, and and, and our, another way of arriving at quantum field theory is to say I'm doing quantum mechanics and I, and I have special relativity. Uh, uh, and, and so giving up on quantum field theory is not, not a thing we should think about too lightly. Um, uh, uh, and and, and so, so here's already, uh, even within quantum mechanics, uh, uh, of course then I've added relativity perhaps as another principle, um, uh, there's already some tension here. So th these are at least part of my, my principles. Uh, of course, uh, nature has gravity in it. Uh, which is precisely why we're sort of still confused about how to combine that uh, with these quantum principles. Uh, and there, of course, uh, a while ago, Newton uh, did a pretty good job at describing it. By the way, here's a, a puzzle for anyone who wants to do something interesting in um, maybe in holography uh, is to understand Newton's laws, at least, of, of how uh, planets move around each other from the point of view of holography. It's not something that we've actually honestly been able to do. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, again, um, it's, it's sort of one of the main phenomenological predictions of gravity. Uh, then, of course, Einstein uh, did a bit better uh, in terms of uh, sort of being having a more uh, fundamental um, uh, and, and sort of more universal description of gravity using general relativity. Uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, from that came all these puzzles. Let me still draw it as a separate arrow, but it comes from general relativity. That you have things like black holes or you have uh, cosmology, um, uh, which by themselves uh, become uh, extremely confusing if you start thinking about these um, uh, space times from the point of view of quantum mechanics. So, of course, again, th that's, that's part of where the motivation lies. And again, all of the theories that are on this side, general relativity, is extremely successful. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and basically what we're doing currently, to some extent, uh, is we're sitting in a phase where, where, where we're trying to reconcile principles that we have um, uh, and running into some, some puzzles. Um, and it kind of means that what we're doing right now is we're th sitting in the, in the phase of theoretical physics that, that I would call the inductive phase, uh, where, where, where basically we have all those puzzles and we want to put pieces of a puzzle and we're trying to put them in the right place. We're, not an, yeah, we're deducing some things, but most of what we're doing is we're doing inductive reasoning. Uh, and the fact that we're living in a time where we have to think inductively about nature is actually extremely exciting. Uh, the, the, the periods of time where people were doing inductive thinking in theoretical physics was the beginning of the 20th century, before quantum mechanics was there. Then Heisenberg and Schrodinger came, and then we have to start de deducing the consequences of Heisenberg and Schrodinger. Then in the 50s and the 60s, we didn't know how particle physics were fitting, fit, fitting together, so people had to think inductively, and then came the standard model. Uh, and right now we're basically again in the phase where we have to start thinking inductively about how to put these things together in a way so that we actually understand what we're doing and, and build this new framework. So that I think is sort of exciting, so that's the motivation. Now, uh, indeed, when we talk about uh, inductive thinking, uh, we usually take important hints, and we have, again, principles. So, uh, and again, Jan basically beautifully summarized it already in, in his lectures and in his colloquium, is that um, 
uh, one of the important aspects, uh, certainly of, of general relativity and of black hole physics, is that it looks very universal. Uh, again, there are not that many black hole solutions, uh, at least they're almost basically unique. The, the rules of general relativity essentially follow pretty uniquely, so universality is an important principle. Uh, and indeed, it seems that, that somehow, for example, suppose we would be living in another world where, where the, the um, periodic table would look a little bit differently, um, then cosmology and black holes and GR probably would still look the same in that other world. So this is the universal part of how we're describing um, uh, uh, yeah, what happens in, in the cosmos. Uh, and, and also here, quantum information theory for sure is a very universal uh, uh, yeah, organizing uh, st structure for, for, for studying physical systems and the information in it. Quantum many body physics is very universal. And in particular, if you go to a regime where indeed you have these many uh, uh, degrees of freedom and things get, say, like uh, chaotic, like uh, Jan was describing, then quantum stat Mac is sort of becomes sort of the way to start thinking about it or indeed more, th more thermodynamic reasonings uh, become important, which again is a very universal way of thinking about nature. Uh, and somehow the link between uh, these two sides goes through, goes through th that particular uh, yeah, uh, intermediate uh, framework. So to me this intellectually is a very interesting set of connections. Uh, and, and there are many reasons actually for why this circle has become sort of more interesting. In the, in, or at least more actively investigated in the last 20 years. Uh, first of all, also even in, indeed in studying actual physical systems in quantum many body physics, condensed matter systems, I mentioned, uh, there's the cold atom systems, there's the quantum computers, quantum many body physics, quantum information, quantum stat Mac is all sort of, of relevance to studying those systems. Uh, and then it's very interesting that there is indeed this universal sort of chaotic regime that starts to have all kinds of properties that, that look like gravity. So that by itself is interesting. Uh, and it's only one element of the puzzle. Um, now, ADS-CFT has been there for a little bit longer than uh, sort of when, when these kind of more recent developments, say, with quantum information came about. Uh, and ADS-CFT came sort of from a development where uh, we were kind of following a slightly different route, where indeed we used basically the, the symmetries of quantum field theory as a way of organizing our thinking. Uh, the standard model has beautiful symmetries. Symmetries can be broken, but things like supersymmetry um, and Lorentz invariance and other symmetries were very kind of uh, key. Uh, and string theory turned out to be this theory that incorporates all these beautiful structures. It seems to combine these two elements, uh, gravity and quantum field theory, and indeed uh, in a Lorentz invariant way. So one of the reasons for why string theory is still kind of the thing that uh, I would say uh, captures uh, most of this picture is it's, it's essentially the only thing that we have in hand that has all these kind of properties of sort of the quantum, quantum physics, but it also has the special relativity and it has the gravity. Nonetheless, at least when we nowadays think about ADS-CFT, the strings are not going to be an assumption. Um, in some ways, they're going to be, we, let me call it emergent. Uh, so that's an, our part of all of this, is that, that, that this, this gravity corner that sits here, we can either think about it as being fundamental, Personally, I'd like to think about the quantum mechanics as being the fundamental block. <laughs> uh, and then there's a way of going between them, uh, which has, again, this more universal kind of uh, toolbox. Uh, and, and, and in some ways, this, this connection is what people call kind of, uh, you can either call it holography, uh, which is sort of has to do with this, this di dictionary, or you can call it emergence uh, of, of, of uh, of sort of properties of gravitational systems uh, from, uh, from thinking deeply, at least uh, yeah, physically, about what quantum systems can do. Now, ADS-CFT, the power of it 
uh, is that it gives us an explicit example of something on this side. Um, and, uh, and a lot of clues about what sits on the other side. Uh, and, that, and the fact that it, we have this e example, uh, it's not even that obvious, by the way, that the explicitness of the example is the important part. It's the fact that we believe that there is such a thing. Uh, and indeed, so what I'm going to be doing in my lectures, I'll talk a little bit more about the CFT side of things. Uh, again, we've already had probably uh, uh, explanations of what ha happens on the ADS uh, side. Um, and I should still say that, that ADS-CFT, although it's a, it's a magnificent kind of tool for, for thinking about this, it has its own limitations. Clearly, we don't live in an entity the citrus space. Uh, so we hope to quickly learn lessons here and push this, uh, this framework in more general directions where we can actually start thinking more about uh, what happens in, in, in flat space or indeed in even better in, 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 a, in a cosmology. Um, so that's, that's sort of uh, clearly what we'd like to do. Um, but um, yeah, so just to illustrate, at least my approach to this will be sort of from this universal uh, point of view, uh, where I will start talking about properties of the CFT that are also universal to CFTs and universal to the type of CFTs uh, that are relevant to holography. Yes, thank you. Yeah, uh, okay, I'll repeat the question. So uh, when, when I, I talk about universality, what am I thinking of? So, uh, for example, in the case of general relativity, I would say that the, the, the input um, that Einstein took to arrive at, at general relativity was very minimal, uh, and his theory only depends on one or maybe two numbers, the Newton constant and the cosmological constant. <laughs> so if you can get an enormous amount of phenomena by only having two numbers, uh, that's part of what I call universal, and then you would like like to think that basically uh, that that uh, yeah, the fact that he found uh, general relativity didn't depend on all the details uh, uh, of of of, uh, of the periodic table or of, of which elementary particles we have, etc. Uh, and again, it turns out that that even uh, sort of the way to start thinking about these CFTs. Uh, we'll do that in the same way. We're going to sort of list properties of CFTs, some of which may be not universal, that are specific to a given CFT, uh, and, and then we want to extract universal properties from it. Of course, uh, again, if you go to Boltzmann, Boltzmann also, he was able to derive all kinds of uh, properties of gases uh, and, and, and things like that without knowing exactly what the molecules are. Right. So th that's, what, that's what we call universal. Yeah. What do you mean by things being present in ADS-CFT? Doesn't ADS-CFT derive from a particular property? Yeah, so, so that's a good question, and I'll, I'll, I'll spend probably the next several lectures uh, answering, uh, at least partially answering that particular question. What I'm saying is that I'm not going to assume that string theory is necessarily the correct way of uh, thinking about it. But let me just make another uh, comment, is that... Um, uh, so, so, so there are ways of getting string-like structures, um, uh, and uh, Jan already mentioned um, uh, random matrix theory. Uh, so, so one way of getting strings, and maybe let me give the high-level answer to this, is indeed to sort of follow the philosophy that Jan already was describing uh, also in the colloquium, uh, where if we are uh, acknowledging the fact that we don't perhaps know the microscopic Hamiltonian, um, uh, then we might sort of start describing this th this theory by means of sort of uh, uh, adopting an ensemble description, uh, where, where indeed we start averaging over our ignorance. So then we the, we naturally are led to consider uh, ensembles of matrices. Uh, and then there is the the famous uh, work of Hoft, who, by the way, also um, uh, came up with holography, I would say, is in, 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 the, in the earliest, and in, uh, already in a very precise form. Uh, and actually, Jan and I are both uh, PhD students from at Hoft, so it's in that respect, the fact that we are kind of following this philosophy is probably still uh, an outflow of our, our advisor, I think. 
but uh, uh, but the, the one over n, uh, the large n limit of a description of, of matrices involves uh, a topological expansion that leads naturally to string-like structures. So as soon as we start introducing random matrices, uh, strings can sort of already, uh, to a certain extent, emerge from that. Um, yeah, so, so, uh, uh, so there's indeed other um, um, developments indeed where people indeed are sort of more, more directly trying to generalize the ADS-CFT setup uh, and thinking about celestial holography, which is sort of the same idea, uh, but then saying that we uh, should use the fact that the Lorentz group uh, in four dimensions happens to be the same as the, uh, conform the group of conformal transformations on the celestial sphere. Um, to motivate sort of a description of physics in four dimensions uh, in terms of a CFT that might live on this celestial sphere. Uh, I'm very sympathetic to, to that program. Um, um, uh, and indeed, it's one of the examples where, where indeed we're, we're sort of trying to push ADS CFT into other directions that allow us to start thinking about more realistic systems. And I'll try to introduce some of, some of those ingredients as well in my, in my lectures. This is just motivation uh, right now, and again, the answers, uh, the questions, uh, as I said, um, I'm not going to immediately answer them because this is more, uh, more motivation. Yes, um, yeah. So when you say strings will not be fundamental here, so, but you are assuming the, that ADS-CFT as a postulate? It's like, like the way... No. Okay, so that's a very good question. <laughs> uh, am I am assuming ADS-CFT as a postulate. So, so I'm talking about principles. One of my principles is going to be that I'm not going to assume ADS-CFT as a postulate. So I'm not going to assume strings. I'm not going to assume ADS-CFT as a postulate. But I want to understand why, if I look at a certain class of CFTs, why the system behaves gravitationally, why it has gravity, uh, why there are black holes. Uh, and can I learn from the point of view of, of the quantum mechanics uh, that the properties are like that of black holes? So I'm not going to start. By the way, uh, 10 years ago, I gave lectures in, 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 uh, at the IAS, uh, and I called my lectures this, <laughs> uh, which I think is, is more my philosophy. Um, so, uh, okay. Coming briefly back uh, still to it hoved. Um, so, of course, uh, I should also go back to, to Hawking, uh, who, of course, essentially has foreseen so many things that we're basically still struggling with, uh, or at least thinking about uh, um, right now. Uh, again, he used quantum field theory uh, and classical general relativity to derive his famous result that a black hole has, uh, has a temperature, um, which is the Hawking temperature, uh, and again, in uh, natural Planck units. I hope I got my factors of pi right here. Uh, it's something like this. Uh, so it's inversely with the mass. Uh, and then even perhaps more importantly, uh, or equally importantly, um, uh, Bekenstein uh, and Hawking um, um, combined, at least, uh, with their uh, thinking about entropy of black hole came with this formula uh, that if you take the area of the horizon of a black hole in divided by four, and here I write the G Newton for now, um, uh, this particular result, is, of course, is really what motivates this ho notion of holography. Uh, and indeed, at Hoft, uh, essentially started taking this formula uh, very seriously. Um, so there's Hawking, there's Bekenstein, Bekenstein. Uh, but I would say that uh, uh, at Hoft started thinking about holography, um, started taking that formula really a bit more seriously. Uh, and the question is, uh, this is entropy. Uh, and entropy, one way of thinking about it is that it counts the number of microstates. Uh, of a system, uh, and indeed famously, um, uh, Strominger and, and, and Fava 
uh, were the ones who actually, in string theory, were able to identify a black hole solution uh, where they actually kn knew how to make the black hole uh, from a, uh, objects in string theory. They could actually count the number of microstates and they got exactly that number. And I'll be honest, uh, until their paper, I would have maybe given a small probability that string theory would be the wrong way of thinking about quantum gravity. But after their paper, I was convinced that uh, if you have a theory that can get this formula correctly, which string theory does, then it must be the right way of thinking about quantum gravity. Uh, and what it means by getting this formula, meaning you start from the quantum mechanics, you count the number of states that you have, uh, and you actually find uh, you, you a number that matches indeed with this, this entropy. Uh, yeah, I'm going to assume unitarity of quantum mechanics, and then I'm going to see if gravity is there or not. So, so and yes, I'll assume unitarity, but I will not necessarily take gravity for granted. Um, I remember a seminar that at Hoft gave when I was still also a graduate student, or maybe even an undergraduate student, where he need to started thinking about uh, black holes, and, and his point of view at the time was um, that he would say, hey, Okay, uh, by that time, the standard model was relatively well understood. So he, made, he had a, he had a, uh, a slide um, um, and, uh, where vertically he put the mass of the particles. So he probably had some neutrinos down here, the electron, protons, um, W bosons, the top quark. And then he said, well, maybe this, he doesn't know what's, what's, what's heavier than the top quark. Um, but eventually he knew that there would be things that would start forming at around the Planck scale, uh, because if you put enough energy together uh, in a small volume of space, you knew that there would be a black hole. So then he would draw this, um, this enormously dense spectrum of states uh, that would be there at, at very high energies, much higher than you can make in an accelerator, but those particles should be there, uh, uh, and then uh, if you take a little uh, energy window here, uh, you can ask how many states are there in that little energy window. Uh, and the number of states that are in that energy window um, uh, is going to go proportional to delta E. Uh, but then it will go, indeed, or let's call it, yeah, let's call it delta M for now. Um, and the spectral density that's called uh, the number of states per, vo uh, per uh, energy window uh, is what this number is counting. So, so basically, um, uh, black holes, you can think about them necessarily um, perhaps as, as quote-unquote elementary particles. Um, and that was uh, the point of his slide uh, where he uh, thinks about this, this very dense energy spectrum. But the key thing that he made, an assumption that he made, uh, was that this entropy uh, is really a finite number because you could, in principle, add a constant to it and that constant could have been infinite. The fact that it's finite was for him important. Uh, and that was actually, to some extent, a radical assumption because, again, if you would, uh, would have sort of done computations in quantum field theory, it's not that obvious that these quantities necessarily would be finite. Uh, so the finiteness of this particular quantity was important. Uh, and then the finiteness of this particular quantity is then equivalent to the assumption that quantum mechanics works, that unitarity is sort of preserved, uh, because if entropy would be infinite, uh, then basically it means that you have an infinitely big gar garbage can in which you can throw in an arbitrary amount of stuff. But if your garbage can is finite, then eventually someone can walk up to the garbage can and empty it, uh, and then everything is again visible, and that's basically how unitarity gets uh, gets restored. Herman, yeah. one, one more. So, you are uh, more than once you mentioned this this fact that quantum field theory has this UV divergence, etc. But shouldn't we think it as defined on the lattice, and then with what whichever continuum limit gives that? So, if I define it on the lattice, I will not have those infinites. And that's perhaps the correct definition of the of the system. Yeah. So so 
uh, of course, uh, so the question is, indeed, is, is lattice field theory, lattice field theory by itself uh, is indeed um, a fine quantum system. I would call that uh, a quantum many body system. Uh, if you want to take uh, a continuum limit, um, again, then literally you take the, the lattice spacing to zero, and this is where the infinities would be coming from. Uh, it should be said that if you keep the lattice spacing uh, finite, you run into immediate issue with Lorentz invariance. So, so you're giving up, at that point, Lorentz invariance. Uh, so that's wh partly why I'm emphasizing this, this here. Um, I should also say that, that uh, I have the same kind of un d discomfort with conformal field theory a little bit. Uh, although I like conformal field theory and I will be doing conformal field theory, conformal field theory is also quantum field theory. Uh, so it will have divergences. Uh, and at some point I'll need, I will start modifying this framework somewhat, where even the CFT side I will kind of start re introducing a cutoff. But then the thing that I still think is actually the more attractive way of introducing a cutoff would be where we still maintain the symmetries, at least the space-time symmetries uh, of the theory. Uh, uh, so, so that's where the tension lies. Now, um, okay, so let me remove this here. So another reason for why ADS CFT is, is, is so yeah, why why was it that, that that we ended up with ADS CFT and not with celestial holography or maybe even the Citrus space? One of the reasons is the following: is that uh, if you uh, talk about a black hole, uh, so here I'm going to draw a, a Penrose diagram. Who does not know what a Penrose diagram is? Uh, otherwise, we can talk about it in the in the problem sessions, or we can uh, so. Uh, in a Penrose diagram, we're basically uh, drawing a space-time where, where light goes under 45 degrees, and we have done some kind of mapping of coordinates where what's infinitely far away comes at finite distance. Uh, and this is what the uh, eternal black hole, the Kruskal uh, black hole, looks like. Um, and if you would draw this, uh, this spatial slice here, uh, then this region here would precisely be where this famous Einstein-Rosen bridge would sit. Uh, this is called scry plus, uh, where outgoing radiation comes, and this is scry minus. Uh, this is the singularity, uh, and then anything that sits inside here is the interior of the black hole, because it always has to go towards the singularity. Uh, in this case, uh, in this kind of setup, which kind of would be the setup for celestial holography, if you wish. Because here I'm assuming that space-time is flat, asymptotically flat. Uh, and then we would perhaps be talking about something that you might want to call a black hole S-matrix, uh, where you throw things in here, uh, or at least you start with em empty space, you throw things in, you create an object. This thing here is a two-sided geometry because it's the maximally extended Kruskal diagram in a, in a more realistic setting. There would be some kind of object that sits here. Let me just draw it like this, where this would not be there. And then the exterior of that geometry, the right-hand side of that geometry, would be what we call a one-sided black hole. Um, in ADS, uh, so this is in, in Minkowski, if you wish, um, asymptotically flat. Uh, in ADS, again, the Penrose diagram of a, uh, of a ADS black hole looks like that. Uh, and, and, and this is useful uh, because it effectively puts the, uh, the black hole in a box uh, where now uh, the asymptotic region sits here uh, and, and time just goes up and we can put a quantum mechanical system on that boundary uh, and, and therefore we now have sort of given ourselves a quantum mechanical time evolution by which we can start studying um, the, uh, the black hole dynamics. Uh, one thing I should uh, maybe emphasize uh, is that if this is a constant time slice, so time goes up here, uh, if this is a black hole solution, then uh, a little bit later the time slice actually looks like that. Uh, at least if I use the time evolution appropriate to the what's called the killing factor, uh, vector, 
so this space-time is static, but only with respect to a time that evolves uh, sort of uh, in a funny way where time actually goes up on the right, but at the same time it will go down on the left. So this is true for the two-sided uh, geometry. And um, again, I could say the same thing is that if this had been a one-sided black hole, again, I would draw this line here, and then I would say, hey, do you know what? Forget about this. And the one-sided geometry would live on that side. So this is uh, how, uh, how ADS CFT hopes to describe a black hole, where we're putting a CFT here on the boundary, uh, and then uh, what sits in the bulk uh, would then be um, a, a gravitational system that we will hope to identify with a black hole. And, uh, and as I mentioned, um, the way we're going to be thinking about CFTs is, is of course, uh, I can, we, we, later on I'm going to actually describe a version of a CFT that's a relatively explicit CFT, where I'm actually going to write down a Hamiltonian, uh, and I'm going to write down that time evolution, uh, and I actually have a quantum system that I'm going to claim would be dual to some gravitational system. But actually it turns out that, that um, apart from a few uh, very symmetric examples like um, uh, the ABGM model, the uh, N equals 4 Yamils, mills and a couple of others, we have actually quite very few examples of CFTs where we actually literally know that there's an ADS dual. Uh, and as I kept emphasizing, uh, in my mind, uh, gravity should be very universal. Uh, so in the end, it should not matter too much uh, of what CFT I'm going to be looking at. Um, there's universal properties of that CFT that should tell me that there's a gravity dual associated with it. Uh, and indeed, uh, so, one, so what my postulate uh, for a lot of this, uh, for the first part of my lectures, is that I'm going to postulate that there is some CFT, some class of CFTs, uh, and that the spectrum of the CFT will look exactly like this, the energy spectrum. It will have some light states. So these are the light states. Uh, think about them as the, as the particles in the standard model. Um, the standard model is not is what I would not call uh, I would not call the standard model universal. If you've seen the standard model, maybe there are a few parts that look a little bit universal, but there are many details of it that seem very arbitrary. Um, but this part here most likely will be. Uh, universal, although there might be microstructure here that may be intimately c related to what happens here, but the coarse grained properties of this thing here should be universal. Uh, so indeed, my assumption is going to be, uh, and this may be my, one of my postulates, by the way, uh, okay, fine, how, 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 how precise, uh, are our CFTs uh, with uh, uh, a spectrum that looks like this. So, so there are, that's, my, that's one of my, my, my postulates. Um, am I 100% certain that such CFTs exist? Ask me that later. <laughs> Uh, but uh, for now, it's my, my postulate. Uh, and then we'll see what we can deduce from that. Um, are there questions at this point? Yeah, I, I will be more precise about later. At least there are bounds that one can put on, on, on the gap. Uh, and indeed, um, again, this is um, uh, governed by the curvature radius of the ADS or in terms of the CFT, in terms of the central charge, if it's doing ADS3 CFT. Uh, CFT2, uh, but this is, yeah, this general structure. Yes, go ahead. Uh, at, at some point, I'll, rather quickly, I'll, I'll specialize to 2D CFTs because that one can make things very explicit there. And there I would, I would want to claim that one can actually derive ADS CFT uh, even without string theory. And to some extent, many aspects of it were already in, understood before uh, before it was understood from the point of view of string theory. Uh, 
Uh, so, uh, and, and the reason for, for doing this in ADS3 CFT2 is not so much because two dimensions is necessarily that much more interesting than three dimensions, but it's simply because many of the questions that we have are dealing with are conceptual and basically are, are we're trying to get uh, the story straight. Uh, and get, and th those questions are already present in the lower dimensional examples, and we just have to sort things out there first. Um, although, as Jan indi indicated, there might be still be special things uh, in lower dimensions that might be different when you go to higher dimensions. Very good question. Uh, uh, the masses don't seem necessarily that universal. The, the thing that I like that almost seems universal, uh, and, and let's all think about this, is that when you take all the particles in the standard model, uh, they all get their mass from the coupling to the Higgs. So the fact that the coupling to the Higgs and the mass of the particle are proportional to each other, to me that seems extremely, that seems very universal. I would almost put the Higgs particle on the gravitational side of the uh, story, um, uh, the, Higgs, the Higgs field, I would say, on the gravitational side of the story. Uh, but that looks very universal. Uh, I assume that gauge symmetry for sure is, 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 is universal. Um, there are other things like the fact that um, most all of the matter uh, seems to be fermions. Uh, that seems to be a universal property. So there's no, a number of things that, that, that sort of look universal, uh, but there are other details. Uh, I think you can see which details would be less universal. Yeah. Um, OK. Um, now, let's, let me briefly still do one thing here. I'm going to write down one solution, um, although today I may not have time to get to it. Um, I might still write it down, and then uh, tomorrow I'm going to derive, basically, uh, using purely properties of conformal field theory, the fact that the bulk um, of the, um, that there is actually physics in the CFT itself that looks exactly like that of a black hole. Um, so I'm just going to, Take the CFT and I'm going to make the, make the CFT look like a black hole to you. <laughs> That's part of the point. Uh, so let me write down. Uh, so the, uh, Jan, I think, already discussed the BTZ uh, black hole. So this is neat in ADS3 CFT2. Um, let me just write it down in a form that I particularly like for this particular purpose. So a black hole has a temperature. Uh, beta is the inverse, is going to be the inverse temperature of the black hole. Um, and then uh, I'm going to have a, uh, a radial coordinate, uh, which is called little r. And this is also squared dt squared. Uh, so this is just the time-like uh, uh, part of the metric. Uh, and then there's a space-like part of the metric, which has an angle uh, and the radial coordinate. And it looks like that. Uh, squared cosine uh, 2 pi r over beta squared. OK, so this is the, uh, a version uh, of the BTC black hole metric. Uh, I kind of like this one. Um, this one here is that's just the spatial section. So indeed, if I, if I take this spatial slice here, and if this is the BTZ black hole, and again, I'm making it uh, extend to, to, to both sides, um, then uh, this is uh, the two-dimensional cross-section where I'm suppressing the theta coordinate. The theta coordinate is, is every point here is a circle described by theta. Radial is out, R, and T is, is, is vertical. Um, this thing here uh, is actually a hyperbolic cylinder. It kind of looks like this. This thing uh, is a trumpet that keeps growing, actually. It kind of has a narrow neck, and then it goes like that. So it looks actually like, neat, like one of those wormholes. Uh, and neat, this, is, this is the ER bridge that sits here, uh, the Einstein-Rosen bridge, which is this metric. 
Another feature uh, uh, is this feature here. How can you see that is a question for you. Um, so R um, goes by between minus beta over 4 uh, and beta over 4. Um, how can you see that this thing is a black hole? Of course, this maybe maybe you think that this already looks like a black hole. What's what else is important about black hole? Why is this a black hole? Yeah, at r equals zero, something's happening. This prefactor goes to zero. Um, this thing here is called g not not. Uh, you can think about G not not as the red shift factor. Uh, basically, if you put your watch close to a black hole, uh, at the horizon of the black hole, the, the watch basically seems to stop. Um, uh, and the fact that the watch stops at the horizon of the black hole is because the G not not goes to zero. So the horizon sits at R equals zero. Um, uh, and if I would put a particle uh, of a certain mass uh, at some distance from the horizon of the black hole, um, then um, uh, it would actually s seem to come get lighter and lighter, at least in terms of its energy. Its energy gets less and less when it gets closer to the black hole. Um, uh, and that's called the, the Tolman factor. So the mass as a function of R so this is the physical mass of a particle of mass m. Uh, it would be uh, the square root of g naught naught. And actually, do you know what? Let me put here something. Because the square root have, has two definitions, so let me do this thing. Uh, times the mass. So, if, so there's some number that's just a fixed number. And then if I start moving that same particle to different locations, uh, it it's gets redshifted if it gets closer to the horizon. And at the horizon, basically, it will not cost any energy to put something at the horizon. The other thing, though, is that if I move through the horizon, I go from positive uh, time to negative time evolution. Uh, so something that sits behind the horizon on this side actually will have negative energy. Okay. So anyway, so this, is, this looks like a black hole. Uh, because this thing here, and let me still write that thing down, this factor here is 2 pi over beta times uh, tangent uh, 2 pi r over beta. Uh, and what I'm going to do for you, uh, maybe not today, but probably in the first half of tomorrow's lecture, uh, I'll derive uh, rather quickly uh, this behavior from the CFT. Uh, precisely this type of behavior. Um, uh, and precisely I'm going to uh, try to recreate this situation where essentially I'm going to put a particle here. So if I put a particle here, so this yellow line is now the world line of a particle. If that particle would have some mass m, then depending on where it crosses this spatial slice, the energy of that particle uh, will become uh, heavier, at least uh, will become more if I go this way, and it will become less and less and go to zero, and become negative the more I go this way. Uh, so I want to create this particular situation uh, in, a, uh, in a CFT. Um, are there any questions for, uh, about that? Uh, then I'm sitting, okay, good question. If this cosine goes to zero, uh, that's precisely at the edge of this interval. Uh, that's when the trumpet blows up, meaning that's, that's when we're sitting at the boundary of the, of, the anti of the hyperbolic cylinder, which is the boundary of the anti dissipative space. Uh, so, so that's what, uh, okay. Now, uh, I've given you a hint. Um, so I'm going to think about a CFT with a spectrum uh, that looks like this. Um, and so the CFT will have some light operators, and it will have some heavy operators. 
um, I need to tell you one more thing uh, is that actually I mentioned as operators, I could also have said that um, this could be the spectrum of the CFT itself, the spectrum of states. Uh, I'll say two words about what's called the operator state correspondence, or has that been discussed? The operator state correspondence has been, has been discussed? Okay. So if I use the operator state correspondence, um, then how do I uh, make a black hole in a CFT? Um, these things are going to be identified. The heavy states, if they're heavy enough, let's make them very heavy. Uh, they will be associated with the very heavy object sitting in the bulk. Uh, and I claim that if I take one of these very heavy states, it can be an energy eigenstate or it can be some superposition of states in a narrow energy window. I claim that that state should be interpreted as a black hole in the bulk. Uh, by the way, not because I'm postulating ADS-CFT, because I'm going to derive it for you. I'm going to put a state with a, with a high and a, a, a large amount of energy, and I'm going to put it there. I'm going to probe it with a particle. How, do I, how am I going to probe it with a particle? So I have a heavy state. What do you do if you want to probe it? Yeah, you look at the correlation function. You introduce an observable. <laughs> Uh, you act on it on the state, you, you compute correlation functions, or you look, compute matrix elements. Uh, so we're going to probe the state, but since, since I want to probe the state with a light particle, what do I do? I act on it with, with a light operator. Okay. So, so that's the thing I'm going to study, uh, and I'm just going to show... So, so basically, if, so let's write down the, the equation. So. I'm going to have a, a state. Let me indeed just denote the state by M. So this is some state with some large uh, energy M. Uh, since radial quantization was discussed, uh, let me still briefly mention that. So if this is time going up, let's call that T, uh, the radial coordinate or the, the angular coordinate, what did I do? Did I do, yeah, theta, let's call it theta. Because by the way, indeed I want to start calling my light operators phi, so that's why this is theta. So this is what my CFT lives on, and again I'm doing this in, this is a three-dimensional black hole, this is a two-dimensional CFT that's going to live on this cylinder. Uh, and indeed I'm imagining that there's some state, some initial state, which is M, that sits in very far in the past, and that's the energy eigenstate of this CFT. Uh, and now I want to start probing uh, that state uh, with, with a particle. Uh, and the way I do that is by taking a light operator. Uh, and the light operator, but uh, yeah, let me do it still. In, uh, I think it's still useful to, to take one more step. Is that um, if I do the operator state correspondence, um, then I'm going to introduce another coordinate system. Uh, which is z is e to the tau plus i theta. Um, uh, this is a, a complex coordinate, combines t and theta in, in one coordinate. The other thing is it has this funny exponent in it, so tau equals minus infinity, uh, t equals minus infinity. Oh, sorry, tau, if this is Minkowski time, <laughs> and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Euclidean time. So then I'll call it tau. Uh, tau Euclidean is I times tau Minkowski, or minus I, one of them. Someone can give me, fix that sign for me. Uh, but anyway, um, if I am Euclidean space, it's natural to go to complex coordinates. This is what radial quantization does. Then the origin in the Z plane um, um, becomes tau equals minus infinity, is, which is where that state sits. Uh, and then constant tau slices are circles. Uh, and therefore, there's the following equation that there is some kind of operator that I can put at this origin that creates that state, and that's the operator state correspondence. Uh, 
Uh, and if I take the vacuum and I act on it with that operator, I create that state. And again, this is the heavy, heavy state. Uh, state uh, or heavy operator. Now, of course, if I want to start studying this particular situation, uh, I need another operator, which is my light operator. Uh, and that light operator I'm going to call, uh, let me call it phi. Uh, uh, and phi will also have some location. Um, actually, I'm going to give it some time location. Uh, uh, sometimes I'm going to suppress the angular dependence, just to keep my equations a little bit simpler. I'm only going to keep track of the tau dependence. So I will have an operator phi of tau, actually. Let me even change my notation a little bit, uh, because I want to distinguish uh, when I use parentheses and I put an argument in it, it's I'm using the z-coordinate system. <laughs> so this is z equals 0. Uh, if I put an index on it, I'm using the tau coordinate system. Um, uh, so, so that's the uh, index. So what I'm going to do, uh, I want to study, uh, let me now erase this thing here, uh, the following state. Uh, let me still talk a little bit more about phi of tau. Um, the, the CFT indeed, of course, has a Hamiltonian. Um, it's true that the Hamiltonian um, uh, on this state then indeed will give me m times that state. <laughs> uh, and that Hamiltonian generates that particular time evolution. Um, and therefore, indeed, I can define uh, an operator phi of tau. Um, and I think I'm getting the signs right here as well. Uh, that if I take an operator at tau equals 0, <laughs> light operator, and I evolve it forward in time, uh, in Euclidean time, that's why there's no factor of i here. Uh, this is how I would do it. So this is just my light operator that I'm introducing. Uh, and, and I claim that. Uh, for now, uh, and this is indeed part of the ADS CFT dictionary, which, I'll, uh, which again is pretty well motivated. But um, this thing creates a particle, um, and since it's acting at some location along the boundary of the of the anti-Sitter space, this thing is the CFT, which lives on the boundary. The phi of tau is acting at some location, so there's going to be indeed some particle that will emanate from that uh, action of the operator. And the idea is that this particle goes into the bulk. Okay. I'm not claiming it does, but I'm going to give you arguments for why why there is a particle associated with it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, so uh, I'm taking st things one step at a time. Um, currently, I'm going to just uh, reason from the, from the side of the CFT, and I'm going to uh, and it look at the properties of the CFT, and, and what I'm hoping to find is indeed uh, uh, a geometry that would be essentially looking like this. Um, actually, it will essentially be closer to the two-sided geometry, so let me still... Um, Remove this a little bit and then make this geometry. So I have this black hole geometry, uh, and and my hope is to basically start probing properties of this geometry. Um, um, so so rather than talking about wormholes that connect this thing with something else, which indeed will start becoming more relevant if I start thinking about density matrices. It turns out that then, then you start talk, thinking about things like replica wormholes. Uh, but if I talk about a pure state, uh, the best I can have is potentially some entanglement uh, that's building up uh, that will lead to the connectedness between the geometries that sits outside of the black hole horizon 
and geometry that sits inside of the black hole horizon. Um, one of the puzzles uh, of ADS CFT is that indeed there's a, uh, uh, the CFT lives on the right hand side of the, uh, of the black hole. Uh, and therefore, a priori, anything that communicates with this line here has to sit in the exterior of the black hole. Because anything that sits to the left of that point can no longer send light rays to the boundary. So a priori, anything I can learn from this uh, CFT would only be sensitive to what's sitting uh, outside of the black hole. I claim that from the point of view of the CFT, I can actually start introducing probes that live in the interior of the black hole. Uh, and, uh, and I'm going to try to probe this whole spatial slice. So I will be able to see this particular uh, uh, circle, little circle here, and that little circle precisely sits at that particular point. So I'm going to uh, show you that there's actually going to be a location in the CFT to some extent that allows me to move through this, uh, this boundary. Uh, the reason why I will be able to do that is precisely because of this um, uh, step that I'm doing here where I'm going to Euclidean time. If I allow myself to introduce a Euclidean time, it turns out that I'm, I can actually rather easily uh, move uh, in this radial direction uh, and even move past, past that point. Um, Again, I haven't done too much in the CFT yet, uh, but for now, uh, let me just say what I want to study. I want to study the state. Okay. Now, um, do you know what? Before I go continue, let me throw a question into. <laughs> um, what should I expect to find? So, what I'm going to claim uh, is that there's going to be a dictionary between this location tau. Uh, and that location R. Um, as you can see, as a function of R, um, if I decrease R, eventually I go to this thing, this, this location here where the energy goes to zero, and then I go to negative energy. So, let me call this state, maybe with some abuse of notation, uh, M prime. Uh, let me just call it uh, M uh, plus phi. Do you know I'm going to already give you the answer? If this is the amount of energy that the particle has, sorry, m plus small m of r. Basically, this is what what the CFT should do. Uh, because uh, where, where indeed there's a relationship between tau and r, uh, and there's going to be a relationship between phi uh, uh, and the particle of uh, and indeed the particle of mass m. Uh, so basically, I'm I would, what I would have to do is I would have to derive for you that if I act with this thing on a state of mass m, that I get a new state, uh, and that the new state indeed will have a higher energy given by m of r, as long as r is, is sitting here, but will have a lower energy when I sit on that side. So this is uh, 
the claim, and I'll put for now a question mark here, uh, but I claim that I can, I'm going to derive this result for you. Okay. Now, uh, in a CFT, there's more data. than just the spectrum, because here you can already see what I'm doing. Um, there's an additional data that the CFT should have. It should tell you that if I act with an, uh, an operator on a state, I get a new state. But each of these two states can be uh, also obtained by acting with an operator on the vacuum. So I can also think about this relation as acting with phi on an operator and producing another operator. Uh, that thing is called an operator product expansion. Um, and um, and then let me be a little bit more uh, circumspect, perhaps. Let me put quotation marks on this thing, because I'll tell you this, the, the sense in which this thing is going to be a true equation. Um, because actually what will happen is that if I act with this thing on that, that operator, I will get indeed a new state, but that new state, if I have a, an actual basis of operators, generally will be some linear combination uh, of, of basis states. So I'm going to write down indeed a, base, uh, 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 a set of basis states, uh, and that, uh, that thing is, is going to be the, what's called the operator product expansion. Uh, operator product expansion. Has this been discussed? Maybe not, or maybe this is about as precise as one can get be about it, is that you act with an operator on a state, you should get a state. If the state can be an operator, uh, then indeed uh, I can write it as follows, that um, phi of tau acting on O uh, m at zero generally can be expanded it can be expanded into other operators, which I'm going to call OM prime. And there will be some, uh, a sum over M prime. There will be some coefficients here that will depend on phi, that will depend on M, and that will depend on M prime, times this OM prime. Uh, and then there will be, these coefficients are numbers, uh, and they depend on the specific C of T to some extent. Although I'm going to claim that the properties of these numbers are going to be very universal, and this is partly where the universality come in, comes in. Another thing that happens is that the, um, um, scale invariance of the CFT uh, will predict uh, the tau dependence of this particular number here. Uh, and so what I need to start introducing for you is that phi uh, is, is an, uh, a light operator uh, and it has a thing that we call a conformal dimension. Um, So uh, I have three conformal dimensions. Uh, phi will have conformal dimension uh, h. That's my notation for the conformal dimension for, for uh, do you know what? h is often used for what's called the left moving conformal dimension. For some reason, I'm going to call this 2h. Uh, I apologize for that. So the conformal dimension for a, uh, phi is going to be 2h which means that phi is a local operator that if I would uh, uh, act it with it at the origin, it uh, has scale dimension 2h. Uh, and then uh, O of m has scale dimension delta m, uh, and O uh, of m prime has scale dimension delta of m prime. Uh, and then uh, scale arguments will tell me that um, it, this should look like that. 
uh, this thing scales and this delta m scat cancels the scaling dimensions of that thing. This thing ac accounts for the scaling dimensions of these two things. Okay. Now, looking at this behavior, this z coordinate here that I'm talking about, uh, z absolute value is e to the e to the power tau. Okay. So this is how that tau and that z are related. So now, uh, the question that I have to ask myself is, uh, what's the energy of the thing on the right-hand side? Because that's what the thing that I wanted to ask myself. This thing has energy m. This thing has energy m plus little m. So I have to figure out what's the energy of the thing over here. Now, in the end, this is a sum, so there's need not one given energy on the right. There's a, there's a sum of energies. But I can easily try to figure out where the thing on the right-hand side has the largest contribution. Now, if, M, if Z is very large, then this number here uh, gets large. Okay, here we go. Let's let's m prime be bigger than m. So so uh, and let it even be bigger than this this combination. Then this thing here um, is negative. So this is z to the power a negative power, which sits in the denominator. So z sits upstairs with a positive power. So therefore, indeed, I claim that if I just look at this whole thing and I make z very large, it's pretty clear that the sum of the right-hand side will get a large contribution when m prime is bigger than m. So z large m prime uh, will be bigger than m, at least for most of the terms in that sum, because the pre-coefficient will be large. However, if z is very small, then I want this number to be bigger than that number for this whole thing to be large, because then the denominator gets small, which means that this thing gets large. So if s z, let me do that here. is small, I claim that m prime wants to be smaller than m. So you have these two different uh, regimes in this particular OPE. Maybe I went a little bit fast here. Um, so, so the claim is again that generally in a CFT you always have an expansion in roughly of this sort. Um, uh, and um, this follows from conformal invariance. Uh, but simply looking at scale invariance, I can already see that there's going to be uh, two regimes. The regime where z is large, where this thing wants to have more energy, and it's going to be a regime where this thing wants to have less energy. Uh, and it's simply because of that particular scaling. Now, the, the thing that I would now need to do is to actually uh, determine exactly what the energy m prime is for which this thing is going to have a maximum. I have the maximum contribution. Uh, and I claim that that energy m prime where this thing has the maximum contribution is indeed going to be uh, that particular function. Yes? Yeah, uh, that's, that's actually a sort of a good question. Can I, can we, uh, what's the, 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 the ra range of convergence of this expansion? Um, so let me, let's do the following, okay? Uh, how am I doing with time? 15 more minutes? Perfect. Okay, good. Um, so I'm giving you, uh, again, some intuition. Um, another way of thinking about this is as follows. Uh, o of M is, is a heavy operator. It created some object, and the object I want to think about as a black hole. For now, it's just the mystery object. 
uh, and I have another operator that acts on it. And it gets absorbed literally by this system, and it starts looking like a linear combination of other things. Personally, for me, always a very useful analogy here uh, is the following, is that think about this as some enormously big hydrogen atom. And M is labeling the, the, energy, uh, the level of the hydrogen atom. It just happens to be a very complicated one with this very random spectrum. I throw a photon at it. The photon has some small frequency. And it gets absorbed by the hydrogen atom and it goes to some excited state. Or maybe, who knows, it might even in a funny way get absorbed and go to a lower energy state, which I claim can happen in this case. Uh, but um, um, this thing then you would call the matrix element. Uh, that Again, this is where Heisenberg got started. This is the matrix element that describes the absorption of an object in, a, in another object. And this is then the, mat the, tra the matrix transition between the initial and the final state. Now, as I indicated, uh, the spectrum uh, of final states is actually a very dense spectrum. So this is called the, the matrix element, so this is the amplitude. So let's start thinking about the absorption probability. What is the probability that I would associate to this particular transition? Uh, and this is actually where Fermi's golden rule comes in. Uh, because Fermi's golden rule uh, actually associates uh, a probability uh, to, to a, a, a transition of this type. And um, so what Fermi's golden rule does, it basically it, it tells you that you have to um, square the amplitude uh, and you essentially integrate or you multiply times the density of final states the density of states, and that gives you the probability. Uh, another way of doing the same thing, actually, is as follows, is that here I wrote it as an OPE expansion, but I told you the thing I'm actually studying is this particular state. Uh, so, so let's actually study the norm of this state and associate a probability distribution to that particular state, which is just by taking the norm. Uh, the norm. So the way we're going to be taking the norm is to multiply the state times its Hermitian conjugate. The Hermitian conjugate of, of um, the cat state is the brass state. Phi will actually, the Hermitian conjugate will ha get a, a minus tau. Um, that's maybe not entirely obvious to everyone. Um, this is called the Belyavin Poyukov sum logic of inner product. Um, that if you work on this particular uh, complex plane, uh, that the bra and the cat Hilbert space, uh, the, the cat Hilbert space sits at the origin, uh, the bra Hilbert space sits at z equals infinity, and the inner product is obtained by doing the functional integral over, this, over the plane. But then uh, Hermitian conjugation uh, is the same as z to 1 over z, uh, which is indeed the same as tau to minus tau. Okay, So I claim that this is the um, Hermitian conjugate of that thing. So if I take the norm, uh, I'm supposed to compute uh, this thing. Uh, Uh, now, what that thing is, uh, it's basically again that, uh, so let's think about this as, as a CFT again on the cylinder, but now I've specified both the state uh, in the far past to be M and the far future to be M. I act on some time, let me just do it here, why not, uh, phi of tau. Uh, and here's its phi of minus tau. Oh, sorry, uh, phi of tau. And let's put phi, phi of minus tau here. Okay, here we go. Yeah, it's actually slightly confusing, but 
Because it turns out if I want this thing to be later than that, I have to take tau negative. <laughs> uh, so um, allow me to switch the sign of tau. I knew at some point I had to do that. But anyway, here we go. Regardless of how we're looking at it, this is a two-point function um, where uh, I have two operators that are separated by a time tau. Um, so that time difference here, uh, uh, sorry, the time difference here is two tau. Uh, okay, um, and I claim that I actually kind of know quite a bit about this object. Um, what you can do, and is by the way, this 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 thing comes with homework. Uh, work out this thing by plugging in that formula. Okay, it gives you a quantity. Um, Assume that your sum over m prime can be replaced by an integral over m, m prime with a spectral density. And then you can rewrite this thing in terms of that. Maybe tomorrow I might do it, or you do it in your homework. So clearly, this thing contains information about the Cs. So if I can tell you from other principles what this thing behaves, what, how this thing behaves, I can, I can tell you a lot of things about how this behaves. And um, Now, the eigenvalue thermalization hypothesis, has that been discussed? You didn't get to that? So I do need to introduce some physics here. I just erased actually something that I want then actually wanted to keep. <laughs> uh, so what I have is I have this big system, which has this very very dense set of energy uh, levels, and I have a tiny little operator phi, uh, and its its matrix elements are being computed between uh, two states. Uh, which uh, I assume to be energy eigenstates, although I could have relaxed that assumption. But um, uh, and uh, and it turns out that those operators, since they're small, they don't necessarily see everything that's happening in the CFT. Most of the stuff in the CFT doesn't interact with those operators. So I can think about phi, uh, about this thing here, as some kind of small subsystem within a much bigger quantum system. Moreover, the quantum system has this enormously random dense spectrum, which means that a lot of the stuff that's happening in the quantum system actually evolves with random phases uh, because of time evolution, basically. Uh, and in that situation, you have something that's called the uh, eigenvalue thermalization hypothesis. Eigenstate, eigenvalue, Eigen eigenstate. Uh, thermalization hypothesis. So it's an hypothesis. Uh, it's not uh, proved in full generality. Um, for now, I'm going to and it make this hypothesis, and then uh, later I might motivate why this is actually a good thing to do. Um, uh, and what the eigenvalue thermalization hypothesis tells you is that if you take the expectation value of, a sm of something that only probes a small part of the system uh, in a state that uh, describes a much bigger system, then basically, from the point of view of the small system, the system looks thermal. Uh, and uh, to very good accuracy, which actually is quantified by this uh, this work by Sretnicki and Deutsch and other people, uh, the claim is that there is some temperature, which is the temperature associated with that energy, such that that <coughs> that this is true. Um, so here, here indeed. So this is indeed an assumption that I have to make. 
uh, but then the rest follows. Are there questions about this assumption, about this hypothesis? So the statement is that if if we're probing a system, uh, a large quantum, random, yeah, basically uh, chaotic quantum system, uh, by uh, a, uh, operators that only probe a small subset of the system, um, then uh, the corresponding expectation value can be replaced by the thermal expectation value. It has something to do with uh, the matrix that, that, that Jan was also drawing at the very end, although I might disagree on the diagonal. <laughs> but the off-diagonal, basically the claim is that, that, that this is a diagonal density matrix, e to the minus beta h. This thing is a pure state. So the question is, this precisely comes back to, to, to Jan's last slide. How can it be that a pure state behaves like a thermal density matrix. It means that, that the difference between this thing and that thing sits in, in off-diagonal components. Moreover, those off-diagonal components have all kinds of random phases associated with it. And, and so therefore, anything that doesn't fit into this form is the sum of things that have random phases. And those things, uh, through random walk argument, basically cancel out. Uh, so you can quantify basically what the corrections to this thing, but up to those corrections, this is a very good approximation of that particular quantity. And this gives you pretty powerful information uh, uh, about, again, all this uh, microphysical data. Uh, it's true that if this time window gets too big, so uh, uh, we're running into issues. So indeed, uh, I, I claim that, that similar as I was restricting R to this time window, I have to uh, uh, restrict tau to a similarly small time window. That's a very good question. Now, um, just as a, as a brief warm-up, uh, if tau indeed is, is close, uh, if one tau is different, close to the other tau, uh, then this thing uh, will behave uh, in a predictable way, because phi indeed is a conformal field uh, with conformal dimension 2h. Um, uh, and this will go like 1 over 2 tau to the power 2h when they're close to each other. Uh, uh, and, and the fact that this two-point function behaves that way is kind of the definition of what I mean by uh, having an operator with a given conformal dimension. So, so two-point functions in conformal field theories have a unique property because of the scaling um, and we normalize it to one. That's the normalization of the operator. Uh, and with that normalization, I claim that the finite temperature thing almost looks this identical, except that now I turn it into a function that's actually uh, periodic in tau uh, uh, with period beta. Tau is Euclidean time, beta is Euclidean time. Because of the cyclicity of the trace, and if you think about this carefully enough, uh, I claim that this is the form of the thermal two-point function. This is true uh, in quantum mechanics. Uh, this two-point function would look more complicated if I would introduce the theta dependence as well. So the fact that I'm only keeping track of the tau dependence is still uh, I'm using a little bit of a trick here to do that. But this is what I'm going to take as the, um, uh, the two-point function. OK. Now I'm almost done. Um,
Because, uh, okay, so what do I do next? Basically, I claim that here's the state m, so let's think about this four-point function, okay? This was the state m. I act on it with an operator phi, and now I'm going to ask, what's the energy of this state here? That energy was m prime, but, uh, uh, but I can measure the energy of that state if I would act with the Hamiltonian here. So if I act with the Hamiltonian H here, uh, I would be measuring uh, the energy of this particular state. Okay. I already know that H acting on M gives me M. So if I want to know uh, the amount of energy that this, uh, this phi is adding, the thing that I'm interested in is actually uh, inserting, uh, replacing this phi by the thing that's the commutator of h with phi tau. Because by taking the commutator of h with phi tau, I'm asking how much energy does, does this thing add, OK? So, so the, uh, this, this is not an operator. This is of order e to the minus uh, s over two. So the terms that I can uh, uh, have ignored are terms of order e to the minus s over two, where s is the entropy. Yeah, if you work this out carefully, uh, this, uh, it, this, this comes. So this. No, no, uh, uh, what I claim is that indeed by taking the trace, I get this answer. Of course, here I've, I've only taken one state. But I claim, I claim that this thing here, uh, if this, uh, uh, simply by the fact that it looks like this, uh, and the fact that tau evolution descri is described by the Hamiltonian uh, essentially fix fixes this form. Uh, and again, the, the key thing here is that this is periodic uh, with period uh, beta. So what I would like to do is I would like to be able to compute uh, the expectation value of this thing with the, with the Hamiltonian sitting on both sides. Um, and um, since phi of tau was obtained uh, by neat uh, time, evolu time evolving with h, this thing is actually also equal to uh, up to factors of i. Uh, oh, no, no factor of i. d tau of phi tau just by time evolution. Sorry, are we doing CFT2 or any of that? We're kind of doing CFT, uh, we're doing CFT2, I would say. Uh, we're, in some ways, we're even doing CFT1 because I'm smearing over the uh, circle. <laughs> uh, so I'm only keeping track of the tau dependence. Because indeed, my question in the end is about the energy. So I'm only keeping track of the energy and of the time dependence. So uh, the quantity delta m prime minus m, delta m, uh, let me call that uh, omega. By the way, in my, in my uh, definition of m, actually, <laughs> these things are the same. Uh, delta of m prime is m. Uh, so this equation here, up here, actually means this. I'm just parameterizing m prime as being m, m plus omega. Omega will, uh, I have made a prediction for it. And I claim that, that 
the following equation is true, that 2 omega is equal to the d tau of the logarithm But uh, because of this particular, so the Hamiltonian that acts here, H, uh, is the same as the scale operator uh, in the z coordinates. Uh, so indeed, m and delta m are actually the same thing. Uh, so indeed, I went from m to delta m because here, indeed, I was thinking about it from the point of view of the z coordinate system. If I go to the tau coordinate system, I'm going, I'm calling it the energy, and I'm calling it m. Uh, you can work this thing out uh, because the logarithm, I get a, a ratio where the d tau acts on the numerator divided by the th same thing that's in here. The d tau can act here and it can act there. Um, uh, and basically what this tau is doing, uh, the d tau derivative doing, it's expanding the, uh, the distance between the two points. So it's indeed literally differentiating this tau dependence. Now, uh, I can plug this now in here, uh, and I can get um, d tau. Oh, sorry, I just, I just immediately, let me just immediately work it out, uh, get it. I get, because of the 2h, I get 2h as an overall prefactor. Uh, because of the 2 pi over b, I get 2 pi over beta as a prefactor. Because of the 1 over, uh, I guess I may get a minus sign, but that, that's something I have to figure out for myself. There may be actually a minus sign here. Uh, and I get um, sine over cosine. Is that right? Uh, cosine over sine, because <laughs> I differentiate it. And then I read the, so I get the cotangent here. Uh, of 2 pi over beta times tau. Okay. Um, by the way, uh, this first equation is homework. Uh, verify that the energy uh, that sits in the middle, which is m plus omega, that that omega satisfies this equation in terms of expectation value. At least it's the expectation value of omega. Um, and, uh, yeah, brackets count. Uh, and I got this answer. Uh, this answer indeed matches with this, uh, provided I have the following dictionary that R uh, is. And here I have to, you have to, excuse me, maybe tau minus beta over 4. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll leave tomorrow, uh, I'll, I'll give you a derivation of that equation tomorrow. So, uh, so I claim that I at least have now rederived this particular expression, but just from general arguments in the safety. Uh, and in view of the time, probably I should stop there. Thank you. Any question that would like to be asked now as a matter of urgency? If not, we'll leave them for the... So. You are using Vila Zorro here, right? In the CFT, you are implicitly using uh, Vila Zorro to derive this universal result, right? Yeah, I would say this one is more general. Um, I'm using uh, scale invariance, and I'm using um, the, the, yeah, the therm thermality of the... Uh, that, that thermal two-point functions are periodic in beta. Um, it's true that, that if I want to make the statement, this statement, 
rigorous in, in, in a 2D CFT. Um, and need, I need to, be a first of all, be a little bit more careful between decoupling left and right movers, basically what I'm doing with the right and left and the right movers. Turns out that the actual two-point function, if I also put uh, the angular dependence in here, actually is the product of two of these factors, one for the left movers and one for the right movers. But I'm only using, as far as I know, the global symmetry. I don't, I'm not, I'm not at this point, not yet using the, um, um, the global, uh, the VR zero, if I make this assumption. So if I want, <laughs> your, que your question is the following. There are indeed arguments based on VR zero algebra that give more evidence for this particular conjecture. So the eigenvalue thermalization hypothesis can be derived using Vero Zoro symmetry mm -hmm. uh, plus yeah, other arguments. Yes. So in n equals 4, if this phi tau was some smeared operator where I integrate uh, and I keep only tau and I integrate over the S3, then I expect that uh, in n equals 4, if I put one operator at tau, one at minus tau, I get the expression on the right-hand side. I thought it was not universal. For any light operator, we expect this result with this coefficient one and so on. Yeah, I haven't fully. It's it's true. I've asked myself that same question. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't necessarily want to make the claim that if I take smeared operators in n equals in higher dimensional CFTs that I get this. This is certainly a, a true equation in in a CFT one. Yeah. Which doesn't rely on Vera zero. Okay. Uh, I can indeed lift it to CFT two mm -hmm. with some care, and that uses left-right factorization, so in that fact, maybe it uses Virozor symmetry. Uh, and certainly, in, in to argue that this is true, Virozor symmetry is useful. Um, um, but um, it's true that uh, the, the thermal uh, two-point functions in higher dimensional CFTs are not sufficiently universal yeah. to, be, to be making this particular statement. Uh, and by the way, <laughs> of course, here I was writing down the metric for uh, a three-dimensional black hole, so I only am doing the derivation indeed for ADST yeah, yeah, CFT. Yeah, yeah. I have to miss the uh, and, and the question. <laughs> and the question is indeed if if there's a similar. It's an interesting question if if one can make a similar argument uh, in higher-dimensional CFTs. The thing that is universal and that is true in higher-dimensional CFT is this particular statement. That, that, that if one takes an opera, you can do radial condensation in higher dimensional CFTs. You can actually have two regimes, uh, one in which the sort of the thing is sort of outside, the other one where it's inside. And I'll explain tomorrow a bit along the lines of also what Jan was talking about, is that indeed this transition is really a thermalization transition. Uh, and in and, 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 and this situation, the phi particle is really hidden and scrambled. In this situation, you can still see it. So here it's outside of the black hole, and here it's going to be inside of the black hole. And that's a, and that's a statement that's true in higher dimensional CFTs as well. All right, so let's, let's clap and come back in 15. Good.